what we're going to do here is this is a really cool opportunity. And I actually asked for this lecture. In fact, I said, why don't we go back to basics? Let's talk about probability. And then let's, let's kind of get a good concept of Bayesian and frequentist probability. And let's build on one of the simplest machines and we'll show it in both frequentist approach and a Bayesian approach. And I think the cool thing about that is after we do that demonstration, it could be extended to more complicated Bayesian approaches. It, you know, from Bayesian linear regression, you can go to naive Bayes classification, you could go to Bayesian neural nets. And so the ideas extend. So that's the idea. We're going to build a strong foundation. Now, first of all, let me just introduce myself. I'm looking across the names. There are some people I don't recognize, so I, I should introduce myself. Last name is Perch, pronounced Perch, just like this right here. Now, uh, if you say it like that, that's perfect. That's as well as I say it. I met Ukrainians who tell me I don't say it correctly. I try my best. I'm from industry. I did spend uh, quite a few years, 13 years in Chevron's energy technology company. Great years. Loved my time there. I've just been a professor for just the last three years, but I do have a lot of experience in data analytics, geostatistics, statistical modeling, and so forth. And now a lot more machine learning, of course. We're all kind of amping up there, ramping up, I should say. And so I'm very flexible. If you have ideas, while we're talking today, if there's something that um, resonates with you and you'd like to hear more, hey, send Avi an email and propose it for a future webinar, right, Avi? We could do that. Um, or if there's, you need us to provide more details. And Avi, I didn't even give you a chance to respond. No, that's great, Michael. Yes, any any feedback or future courses? That's perfect, it. right? That'd yep. be super cool. Yep. And also, if at any point you want to interact with me, go ahead, use the chat window, and we can discuss or I can answer questions. Okay, I'm available. I have an open door policy. I'm super busy, but I drop me a line. People drop me a line all the time. I'm happy to discuss. I'm an engineer and a geoscientist. So if you are a geoscientist and I'm using terminology that baffles you, it doesn't make sense to you, ask me again and I'll explain it from the geoscience perspective. I teach engineers and geoscientists. I'm duly appointed in the Jackson School of Geosciences and the Cockrell School of Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm actually thinking about starting to take on some PhD students over there too. I think it's super epic, very cool. Okay, so I do frequently teach and consult within our industry. I'm aware of our current problems. I'm advising on a lot of workflows and so forth. I have a variety of partnerships. And so I think I can speak from a position of expertise on statistics, modeling, data analytics, geostats, and also machine learning now. I also am very active outside of or in the public if promoting and advocating for open education. And if anyone's interested, check out my YouTube channel. I have all of my lectures from the University of Texas at Austin there on GitHub. I have many of my well-documented workflows. There's a lot of resources out there to help people. I'm very much a fan of supporting professional development, encouraging people to go into STEM. I actually think the role of a professor is a role of service to the state of Texas and our country and beyond. That's my motivation. Okay, what are we going to do today? Well, I thought, why don't we teach the theory and the applications so that you can immediately have impact tomorrow or today, this afternoon, you can do things with it. And that's the idea. I wanted to deal on frequentist probability. We're going to cover Bayesian probabilities. And then I'll show you some interesting probability concepts, what you can do with probability. And then after that, what we'll do is we'll dive into frequentist and Bayesian machine learning, the simplest machine, linear regression. But I'll show you how you can, how it'll be different, what impact your statistical perspective, Bayesian or frequentist, will have on your machine learning. The whole idea is this, strengthen your foundation in machine learning by building it on a very strong foundation of probability. I do think a lot of people dive into machine learning without first dealing with probability. And I think that's essential. Let's talk about probability. We'll have just some general comments around probability and then we'll, don't worry, we'll work up to some applications pretty quickly. So this will just be kind of a, uh, a little philosophical about it at first, for sure. Why cover probability statistics for machine learning? 
Well, I do agree with the book of James and all. James and all suggest that machine learning is statistical learning. I actually feel that way. And I use that term all the time with my students to remind them that machine learning is a statistical approach. Machine learning methods make predictions based on sample data, summarization statistics. Those are the model parameters. If you know about decision trees, you'll realize that the model parameter is an average. It's just a statistic conditional within a region of the predictor feature space. All of the methods around random forest, it's all about variance reduction. You can calculate all of that through statistical expectation. It's all a statistical approach. It's very cool. Probability models, priors, conditionals, maximum, a posture, estimation, all of this stuff is statistical. So when we build on statistics, we do a better job with machine learning. Therefore, robust use of probability and statistics, I would say, is a critical step to being able to work with machine learning, not as a black box, but as the mechanic who understands what's going on under the hood, much more powerful. Even if you're just a practitioner, and I shouldn't say just, but if you have no plans to develop new theory and new machine learning methods, it's still very powerful. You're much more impactful if you understand what's going on under the hood. And the contrary, if you don't understand what's going on under the hood and you're running it like a black box, you can make big mistakes. Things can go wrong. All the time I ask questions on exams for my students and they find out that if they don't know what's going on under the hood, they're not gonna be able to explain, understand the concept. So probability, why do we even care about probability in the subsurface? Now I anticipate everybody here is probably in agreement about this. Probability is the main driver for all of our decisions. Think about it. what is the probability of a well being successful? That's how we decide whether to drill the well probability that a valve has a crack in it, well, we'll decide about preventative maintenance and what we need to do to keep things reliable and safe in operation. And even more complicated, those folks who work in the value of information, what's the probability a seismic survey is going to find a reservoir, find a feature, or change the volume of the reservoir? That will drive whether or not we acquire the seismic. And then finally, what's the probability a reservoir seal will fail? Well, if you're working in CO2 sequestration, that, that's huge. We got to make sure that's going to stay down there. Or we might be concerned about whether or not we actually have a success in our drilling. We have actual fluids. Now, most of our decisions evolve uncertainty. And so we need to quantify through probability to make better decisions. In fact, I have an entire lecture. This would be another thing we could do, Avi. Decision making in the presence of uncertainty. How do you do that? How do you make the best decisions? Very cool stuff. Now, I've said probability about 10 times. And because I'm a professor, I need to, you know, I need to define that. I need to say exactly what I mean by probability. One thing that's really cool is you can go back to kind of the, you know, the fundamentals, the fundamental thought on probability. Kolmogorov has three axioms on probability. Probability of an event is a non-negative number. That's interesting to just think about it. It's a number and we already recognize negative probability. Well, that's the type of thing that's paradoxical. It's going to end the universe. It should not happen. It's a unit measure probability of an entire sample space is one. And this is a concept that we'll deal with over and over again. We call it closure. The probability of all possible outcomes must sum to one. And so omega is usually used to represent all possible outcomes. Additivity and mutually exclusive events was, isn't that interesting? Komogorov saw that as one of their three fundamental axioms. This idea that the union of different events, AI, where I would be from one to whatever number of events, as long as they're mutually exclusive, you can just sum them, okay? And this is a commonly known additivity rule within probability. Well, it's kind of cool. And I think none of this should contradict any of our insights, but this is how we could start. We could start thinking about what probability means as a non-negative number with closure and additivity relations. Now, another way we can go at it is we can think about what are different perspectives to calculate this number, this measure. Now, I have to admit, this is pretty alluring. The whole idea of long-term frequencies, which is actually known as the frequentist approach, 
is really interesting. Probability is a ratio of outcomes. Now, do you guys all heard that word, right? Outcomes. That means that this concept of probability is tied to the idea of an experiment. Okay, so you're making multiple observations with your experiment. It requires repeated observations. Okay, so that's the idea of a frequentist approach. Now, how do I summarize that? And I'll say it again later. Frequentist approach to probability is counting. That's it. It's just counting. Counting and ratios. It's as simple as that. Physical tendencies and propensities of the system is really, really interesting. Now, this is where we get into the idea of probability from the perspective of expert knowledge. And so what we say is that we can calculate a probability from our understanding of the behavior of a system, our knowledge about the system. Now, could you know the probability of a coin toss without an experiment? I think you could. You could look at the physics. You could look at an individual coin, you could look at its weight distri distribution, its moment of inertia, whatever you need to look at, and the way it's tossed, I think we could figure out that this will be a 50-50 with only a one in whatever it is, 100,000 or so chance to land on its edge. You see what I'm saying? That doesn't happen too often. I think we could figure that out from the system. I don't think I need to toss this coin. I don't think we need any degree of belief either. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, we're not going to talk about number two. Today, we're going to focus on number one and three. Let me cover number three. This is the idea of degrees of belief. What we do is we use our certainty about the result. We have some knowledge or belief. We have a, a prior that comes from our belief. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to update with new information. I think I know this coin is 50-50, chance of heads and tails. And now I'm going to flip it, get new data, and update. This is the fundamental Bayesian approach. Prior, your belief, likelihood, new information or observation, and then you update to get to a posture. Oh, very powerful stuff. We'll cover that in much more detail. So these are three fundamental perspectives on what a probability is, that non-negative summing and closing value we talked about before. Let's go ahead. We're going to cover the two in more detail, frequentist and Bayesian. Let's just put some a, a better definition around that because I just kind of made some comments and showed you a coin. It's a measure of likelihood that an event will occur for a random experiment, well-defined setting. It's tied to the experiment. This is one of the major complaints that Bayesian statisticians have about the frequentist approach. They say it doesn't exist outside of the experiment. Now, I don't want to get too philosophical, but that is really, really interesting. What does it look like? The probability of event A. Uh, we can use shorthand P of A, and I'll do that all over the place in the notes going forward, is equal to the limit as the number of trials goes large of the number of times that A occurred, that's a frequency, the number of times that anything occurred, that's just gonna be N, the number of trials, okay? And so we can use this ratio right here to calculate a probability. So I told you, it's just counting. Uh, I can go ahead and take an example, the probability of drilling a dry hole for the next well, or encountering sandstone or rock porosity about 15%, you just count the number of times you saw that previously and you divide by the total number of times and you get that ratio. I think many of us, when we think about probability, we're thinking as frequentists. It's a very common perspective for sure. Now the Bayesian approach is different and I'm gonna show you the derivation of Bayes' theorem right here. So don't get too worried about this. We'll just use it as kind of an illustration or more kind of artistic at this point. Later on, we'll put more definition around it, discussion. It's a measure of likelihood that an event will occur for any occurrence, so probability of A given B. The Bayesian approach goes like this. We're going to interpret a reasonable likelihood representing our state of knowledge. This is going to be a prior right here. It's our quantification of our belief before we collect the data. Then we're going to update with new available data. This is a likelihood shown right here. And then we'll get to a posture. And the posture is now our updated belief with the prior plus the likelihood from new observations. It's a beautiful thing. If you think about it in our field, we're constantly updating. 
In fact, I, I was involved in modeling the subsurface reservoirs all over the world. And that was one of the interesting aspects is you're constantly updating the new, the previous subsurface model as you collect new data. It happens all the time. Okay, so that's the Bayesian approach. Now, I just wanna make sure everybody here is comfortable with Venn diagrams. Just a very quick reminder about a Venn diagram. It's a drawing like this. It communicates probability. The whole idea is that we'll have omega as the entire space of all things that are possible. In fact, you'd be surprised how many times I have to take marks off from my students drawing Venn diagrams because they forget to draw omega. That matters, right? The size of this square right here. That's all possibilities. I hope you can observe immediately if this is the area representing B and the area representing A, that we can anticipate that if that square was to become bigger, make that square really big, what would that do to the probability of B? Who thinks that that would, would that go up or down if I made this omega square bigger? Anyone by the chat window. And Avi, I'm pretty sure we probably have a little bit of lag, right? There we go. Yeah, okay. cool. All right, Emmanuel, you nailed it. You get 100%. You get an A for that. That's exactly it. Thank you very much for your interaction. I do appreciate that. It would go down. If you make the square even bigger and bigger, the probability of B is going to go down. Now, let me challenge you on something. What is the probability of A and B occurring together? Anybody? I think we probably have some people here who are Venn diagram um, experts. Zero, Lori, you nailed it. You got 100%. None, Emmanuel. Manuel, that's two for two for you. M Manny, you get that too, okay? Everybody gets to 100%. Very good, guys. I appreciate that. So everybody understands Venn diagrams. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. That's important. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's just present a concept. And that concept is known as conditional probability. This is one of my favorite things to teach from a Venn diagram and it leads to Bayes' theorem. And that's why I'm doing it. Please realize I'm not doing anything for fun. I have method to the madness. We have a plan. The probability of B given A is a conditional probability. Okay, the, we use this shorthand right here, P, B, this vertical line, wherever you see that line, think given. That's what you're going to say, given. B given A is actually equal to the probability of A and B, the intersection. Now, in my notes, I often just put P, uh, A, comma B. That's a shorthand for it. Divided by the marginal, the probability of A. Now, you look at this equation, the very first time you see the definition of a conditional, it may seem a little confusing. Let me show you on a Venn diagram exactly what a conditional probability is. If I wanna calculate the probability of B given A, what I do is I go to the Venn diagram. Now I said given A. In other words, omega doesn't exist. We now know that all possible outcomes are A. You shrink your universe to A. So imagine this square shrinks into A. Now you have to calculate the probability of B given A. It is this intersection right here divided by the probability of A. You see that? So I hope everyone can see that the definition of conditional probability is axiomatic. It's, it's, you can perfectly understand it by looking at a Venn diagram. We shrink our universe to A. Now you can do vice versa to B. You can flip that around. Not a problem. Now, let's take that definition of conditional probability. That's the same thing we had on the previous slide. Let's rearrange it. Uh, guess what? Probability, it has the same algebraic relationships. You can go ahead and just multiply both sides by the probability of A, and you can put it on the other side. This equation right here now becomes this equation right here. Okay. Now I can formulate, I can do the mirror image, and that's this equation right here. This is known as the multiplication rule within probability. Now, the cool thing about it is that there's no assumptions here. I didn't have to make any assumption about independence or anything like that. Nope, this just holds. Now, it follows, can everyone here agree that the probability B and A is equal to the probability of A and B? In fact, there'd be no expectation of a directionality or ordering relationship. It doesn't matter. 
I hope everyone can accept that. If you can accept this, I can take this, substitute that there, take this, substitute that there. And when I combine the two, pro the two rules, multiplication rules, I get this right here. This is what I get. So this, my friends, is known as Bayes' relation or Bayes' theorem right here. Okay, so we got Bayes' theorem. Let's just talk about what we can do with Bayesian statistical approaches. Probabilities where we can come, where we can integrate this the idea of expert experience and belief through a prior. We can update with new information. We can solve probability problems that we could not use simple frequencies. What's an example? Well, I really do like the Bayesian tutorial book by Savai in 1996. And what's interesting, I think this is the first edition only. They have an example where they talk about the mass of Jupiter. And what they say is that a frequentist approach, they would have to have multiple Jupiters measure their masses from multiple solar systems, and then they would use that to try to work out a mass of Jupiter. Now, what's interesting is you got to remember in 1996, we weren't exactly swimming in exoplanets, right? At the time that they wrote that, I don't believe they had confirmed exoplanets. So they weren't really, you know, had a whole bunch of examples of Jupiter-like planets to work with. What they said is what we can do with the Bayesian approach is we can form a prior probability and update with any available information, no matter how soft that information is. In fact, you can do Bayesian updating where you have information that is not really informative. In that case, the posture becomes the prior. So it'll work. It'll actually work. We can work on a problem that we could not solve with the frequentist approach. The Bayesian statistical approach, probabilities based on a state of knowledge, degree of belief in event, will utilize assessment of a prior um, to, and then we'll do data collection, update with new information as it's available, and we'll solve probability problems that are very difficult to do. And I would say not practical with pure frequentist approaches. Now, there is a lot we could get into here. There is whole new concepts, for instance, Bayesian credibility intervals actually do provide a much more intuitive measure of uncertainty than the traditional frequentist confidence intervals. There's so many other concepts we could talk about. Now, let me just make a couple of other observations about Bayes' theorem. First of all, I think this is really cool. We can go from the probability B given A to the probability of A given B. I see this as a conditional probability inversion. And to be honest, there's many, many cases in our world in which we can calculate this probability, conditional probability, but we cannot get that one directly. So this approach is very handy. And I'll show you an example right away, just to kind of dispel the mystery around that concept. Now, each term does have a name and I've said it already. Let me just show it here prior probability of A, likelihood, probability of B given A, and posture, probability of A given B. And we have an evidence term right here. Now I need to make a couple important concepts here. There's no cheating. You don't get to cheat in Bayesian statistics. And this is what cheating looks like. The prior should have no information from the likelihood. Do you think anybody does that? You gather a couple of wells, and then you now you update the prior a little bit. You say, well, let me narrow it up a little bit. And then you do Bayesian updating with those wells. You see that? That's double dipping. You don't get to do that. If you do that, you will prematurely narrow your uncertainty distribution. It's very dangerous. In fact, a good friend of mine, Professor Jeff Karras at Stanford University, had some great publications and discussions around exactly what a subsurface prior looks like. And in general, if I, I hope I don't misquote, but it sounded like we really need to have broader priors than we think. We're often doing this. We're often cheating and double dipping with the data. Evidence term is usually just a standardization. It ensures closure. In other words, that all the probabilities sum to one. And I'll show you that. I'll show you a Bayesian linear regression. It's really gonna be um, what we call marginalized out. It's not too bad. Okay, now this is a good way to express Bayesian statistics. I like this. I like this instead of A and B, which is very abstract. I like to do it like this. And this is how we're gonna do it when we work with Bayesian linear regression shortly. The prior is the probability of the model or the model parameters. 
the likelihood is the probability of the new data, the new observations given those model parameters. And the posture is now the probability of the model given the new data. That's the, that's the updated form. Now what's fascinating is the evidence term doesn't care about the model. It's just the probability of the new data, which is really, really cool. This, this is really, really interesting. But I think this is a much more intuitive way to look at Bayesian updating. Now, let me go ahead. I'm going to show you an interesting variant of Bayes' theorem. Then I'm going to show you a practical problem, and then we can get into doing some machine learning with it. Okay. I told you we had to build on a secure, firm foundation of probability. I got to spend a lot of time on probability. I can't just jump into machine learning. Okay. Alternative form, okay, so we have the original Bayes theorem readjusted where we put the this side on the left side into the denominator on the other side. Now, what's very interesting is just using fundamental probability axioms, we can go ahead and actually calculate the probability of A, this denominator, as an expanded form. The probability of A is equal to the probability of A and B plus the probability of A and not B. Now, if you think that through, you can see that that's actually pretty intuitive. Now we can go ahead and take this, and this is just that multiplication rule that we showed before, or the readjusted conditional probability equation. We can substitute here and here this expanded form. The result is we substitute for probability of A, this plus that, and now we get this form right here. Why have we done that? The evidence term is often hard to calculate. It is, and this expanded form is actually very easy to calculate in many problems. In fact, if you look at it, you'll see this is just this part right here repeated, and now we have to get the one conditional on not B or B complement, okay? So B complement right here, and not B occurring. All right, so when are we gonna use this expression for Bayes' theorem? Well, there's many cases of problems that we have in life, and they go, they go under this form. What is the probability that something is happening given it looks like it's happening? You see what I'm saying? The probability something is happening given it looks like it's happening. In other words, the probability there's something occurring given there's a positive test. That would be a good way to describe it. So what would be an example? And I don't want to be flippant about this at all, but what about the case of somebody has a disease? Well, event A is they have the disease. Event B is they test positive for the disease. Does everyone agree that those are two totally different things? One of them would cause you to make phone calls and make arrangements. The other one would be, I need to get more testing done. I need to check more, right? And so there's a whole bunch more, of course, from the subsurface, low permeability of a sample, given the laboratory measurement of that sample is low. There can be error in the measurements. You drill a dry well, given seismic AVO response is suggesting that there is a problem, fluid rock problem there or something like that. Okay, so these are all types of problems like that. Now, if you look again at our expansion, what you'll realize immediately that what we're actually calculating in the numerator is the true positive. That is the probability of true positive. The probability of B occurring, given it looks like it's occurring, B and A together, that's the top. This is a true positive probability right here, and this is the false positive right here. That's the probability that you have a positive test given B complement, meaning the thing is not happening. Okay, so this is really interesting. We can solve a problem. Now, I'll just show you this pretty quickly. But this is a nice problem right here to demonstrate the utility. I hope this is something you could just use at work. Prior information site selects a channel feature exists at a given location with probability of 60%. So in the reservoir, you think you have a channelized structure that you can utilize. It's a flow unit. You could drill it and inject water. You can produce oil and so forth. We decide to further investigate using seismic information. Okay, the seismic survey can show the feature is present with 90% probability if it really is present and is not present with a 70% probability if it is not. Okay, so this is interesting. Let's start to put some definitions on this. A, the feature is present. That's the thing I really care about. B, seismic shows the feature is, the seismic indicates 
that there's the feature. A complement, the feature is not present. B complement, seismic, the test is negative. Okay. Now what's fascinating is we can now put this problem into probabilities, conditional and marginal probabilities. The probability of the channelized feature was 60%. That's based on geologic interpretation, based on analysis, other type of analog information and so forth, soft data. Now we have the probability of B given A, that's the probability of having a positive test given there is a channel feature. And we already said the seismic has a 90% chance of seeing a channel if it's there. The probability B complement, that is the seismic does not show the feature given it's not there was 70%. Now what's very interesting, we can solve this problem and we can actually calculate this. The way we do it is we use closure relations. We know the probability of the seismic feature, the channel feature not being there is just one minus the probability that's there. So that's 40%. We have 60% for it being there. Probability of B given A, seismic shows the feature given it's not there. Mm, that's getting it wrong. That's one minus this right here. We have conditional closure. So we got 30% for that. We get the rest of it's plug and chug into our expanded formula. And we get the probability the channelized feature is there given seismic shows the feature is equal to 82%. Now I can ask the question, is that seismic worth it? Would you spend the money on the seismic? Does it look valuable? That's an interesting question. The first thing I would say is, look, 82%, if I have the seismic information, that's a pretty high certainty that we have that reservoir unit. And that's a good objective for us to try to drill. The other point I'd make here, and I think this is very powerful, the prior model was 60% probability of having the channel. If we shoot the seismic and it indicates it there, it's there, we update to 82%. We went from 60% probability to 82% probability. That's a significant reduction in uncertainty. And you can put that right into value of information, decision analysis type of workflows. You can use that. It's very powerful. Okay. So I hope you guys, that was interesting to you. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about linear regression. Then we'll talk about the Bayesian linear regression approach. This will give us a chance to build up on machine learning methodologies. Why linear regression? Simplest machine, highly interpretable. Very good method for us to work with. Build from common linear regression to Bayesian regression. We get to include a prior, a likelihood model from data. We sample the posture. So we get to, to show the entire workflow and we can directly integrate uncertainty with this workflow. How do we do linear regression? Well, if we were working within Python, it's literally one line of code. In SciPy stats, we can go ahead and just use the Lin Regress program. In Scikit-Learn, they have their own linear regression program. There, there's so many available to you. And in fact, if you look it up, there's an analytical expression that's really just based on covariance and variances and very easy to do. You can calculate the whole thing by hand. So. We go ahead and run that and we get the slope, the intercept. This is a single predictor feature, single input. We're predicting density from porosity. Model looks just like that, very easy. Now, how does it actually get fit? How do we train the model? The way it gets trained is we're going to be looking at minimizing a loss function. The loss function for us will be the sum of the squared errors. If this is the predictor feature, this is the response feature, these are all of the error terms right here. The analytical expression allows us to find the very best parameters such that we, such that we minimize the squared error across the data. Now that's what we're going to do. That's where, so now we can go ahead and solve that. We do, and we get a model right here. And it looks great. You know, there's some scatter around. It's not a perfect relationship. There's noise for sure. And we can do this such that we minimize the error across the data. Now, the interesting thing to me is this, is everybody knows linear regression. I hope there is a general sentiment of disappointment as I discuss right now, because it's so simple. It's so well known. I hope that people realize that even this simplest machine has a whole bunch of assumptions and limitations. Well, error-free. Did you all know this? That the predictor 
variables or features. The X's must be error free, not random variables. Okay, so they so technically what that means is you accept error in the vertical direction here, not the horizontal direction. You assume those data are perfectly known. That's not the case. In the subsurface, I argue we have no certain data. It's all got uncertainty. Linearity, well, that's a no-brainer that the, the data behaves in a linear manner. And if it's not, that's a poor model. That's a high model bias, and we could talk about that. Constant variance. This is my favorite word in the whole wide world, homoscedasticity which means that the error should be constant over the range of the predictor feature. The other thing is that we assume there's independence. There's no correlation. Okay, I hope you get the point. There's a lot of assumptions that we have whenever we build these machines, and that'll be the case for the Bayesian methods too. The other thing that's very cool is we can calculate confidence intervals. These are frequentist confidence intervals. I'm not going to go into the derivation or explanation here. They're based on sampling distributions and the concept of standard error. We have entire content where we get into this. I think this is pretty fundamental for data analytics. To put a plug out for one of my PhD students, they just sent a paper for um, peer review publication on geostatistical confidence intervals and significance testing. I think it's pretty powerful stuff. Okay, we can also calculate the prediction interval. Now, one thing I should mention, a confidence interval is the uncertainty in the model. The prediction interval is the uncertainty in the next prediction from the model. And so I show it right here. We can, in fact, given a density value, this equation gives us the full uncertainty in the porosity which is very powerful. That's, that's an uncertain model you can take to the bank. <laughs> that's gonna be exactly how we get volumetric uncertainty. So that's very powerful for us. If we're working from seismic, for sure. Now, of course, we just talked about Bayesian approaches and how it's based on degree of belief in the event, update with new information. I hope that you saw from everything I just said that there is absolutely nothing Bayesian in, which I, in what I just discussed optimizing, minimizing a squared error just based on a data fit. I, there was nothing prior. There was no updating. There was no posture. Yeah. What's interesting is if we go to Bayesian linear regression, we can start doing that. We can solve probability problems that we cannot use simple frequencies for. Okay. Let's, let's look at that. What does the model for linear regression look like to a Bayesian statistician? Well, you saw what we had before. What we had was just a sum of weights plus a constant term. This is how Bayesians, Bayesian statisticians see linear regression. They see why the response distributed as, every time you see that symbol, that means distributed as a Gaussian distribution. So they made some distribution assumptions and I wanna be very careful about that. There are a lot of assumptions around distributions, conditionals and so forth that I'm not discussing for today. Even when we solve this problem, I'm not going to cover it. I'll just show you a solution. You'll notice these beta right here, it's a vector and it's got all of the parameters for multilinear regression. This is the X that is all of the predictor features and it could be a full two dimensional array with all of the rows and columns representing columns of different features, rows are the different samples, that's the data table. And now this is a Gaussian distribution. We have a mean, that's the ex expectation. And we also have the standard deviation or the variance. And that right there is represented by sigma squared, the variance, and it's a homoscedastic variance. So we're still gonna make that assumption. And we just, because we're working in matrix notation, we have an identity matrix there to represent the idea that it's variance across each one of the, each one of the parameters that we're gonna be working with or features, I should say. Okay, so now this is to a Bayesian statistician what a linear regression model looks like. What do we learn from that? The big difference is you immediately are accounting for distributions of everything. All of everything we're working with, the model parameters, the variance, the predictions, everything is, we're accounting for the distributions. Very powerful. Let's show you how it gets solved. Because I told you with Bayesian approaches for machine learning, we're gonna do a prior likelihood and posture, we're gonna update. That's exactly what they do. And I shouldn't say they, I work in Bayesian approaches too. So I guess I can say we. We formulate linear regression model and we're gonna look at it like an updating problem. We have a prior distribution of the model parameters. 
Now we have the likelihood. This is the data, the training data, Y, the response, X, the predictor feature, the input, given the model parameters. Isn't that cool? And then we can go ahead and update and get the model parameters given the training data. That's the whole Bayesian formulation for machine learning to get a prediction model. Okay, so we're gonna solve it like that. Let me make a couple of comments just to reinforce before I show you code. Don't worry, I will show you code right away here. The prior model, it's the initial inference of the model parameters. It's a distribution for each one of them. All of the slope terms, the intercept term, all of them, you have distributions of uncertainty. That's powerful. You got a prior, but it's also accounting for uncertainty. Very cool. Now you could have expert knowledge. You could say, well, before the data, I knew this and no peaking. You're not allowed to peak. You can't use the data to help you get this prior. You can go ahead and say that I had this expert knowledge and you could do that. You could also work with a naive non-informative prior. And I'll show you in that case, the result will actually converge on what you would have seen with the frequentist approach because you're not updating, but you still account for the uncertainty, which is very powerful. The prior to integration of the training data, remember no peaking. The likelihood term is going to encapsulate the information from the training data, Y and X is the response and the predictor features. This is fully data driven. As the number of sample data increases, the likelihood is going to become stronger, more certain. In fact, if you have enough data, you will overwhelm the prior distribution. And this is really, really cool. Now, I should also say that if the prior is naive, the whole thing is going to be driven by the likelihood. So it's a bit of a battle between them. Whichever has more information is going to dominate, which is very cool. The evidence term, as I mentioned before, will be just a normalization constant to ensure closure. It ensures that all the probabilities you calculate sum to one. And what's really fascinating about this is that it's independent of the model parameters, and we can actually solve it by marginalization. If you look at this, we're actually integrating over all of the possible numerator values, and it, that's how we calculate it. So really, it can be seen as, as we calculate the probabilities, we're basically just going to set them to sum to one. That's effectively a normalization to ensure we have closure. That's all it is. And the posture, of course, is going to be the update. It's going to be based on the data-driven information and the prior, and they're gonna balance. If you have lots and lots of information from the data, you're gonna have the data is gonna drive the posture. If you have lots of information in the prior, you say that you absolutely know what's going on. I got my students in class to do this recently, put no uncertainty on the prior, the posture will be equal to the prior. Very powerful concepts. Now, there's something I'm gonna skip over. I'll show you in code, but I'm not going to explain it. This problem is fundamentally intractable to just try to solve directly. The only way we can solve it, because it really is probability density functions at a very high dimension. The way we could solve it is we do a sampling approach like Markov chain Monte Carlo. And if we had more time and we we're doing a full course, we would spend like an hour or so talking about and demonstrating MCMC. Okay, so this is what my example is gonna look like. I'm gonna go ahead and show you, but you, you know what I think? It's more fun to look at code. Let's go ahead and get the code open and we can go ahead and walk through that. Now, does everybody see the code? Can, can everybody see this window right now with code? I hope nothing switched. Yes, Michael, we can see it. Okay, you can see it. Thank you very much, Avi. And thank you, Lori. I do appreciate you jumping in. Okay, and how do you like the font size? Are you guys comfortable with that? Everyone can read that on the window? That's working for you? Good. Uh, uh, Manny, thank you very much. And Lori, I appreciate the interactivity. It's very cool. James, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate in Python using standard open source uh, data science software like SciPy and Scikit-learn and so forth. We're going to demonstrate the linear regression, the frequentist approach and the Bayesian approach, and we'll compare and contrast them. We'll look at the diagnostic plots. It'll be a very complete workflow, but I hope you can see, while well, it's a very simple model, you can extend it to a more complicated model. These concepts of Bayesian and the frequentist approaches. Now, you'll notice here that I have put the equations in documentation. Every time on our learning management system, we provide well-documented workflows for anybody to be able to work through to see the examples. The very first thing we do, let me just ask on the call, 
Is there anybody here? And I hope, no, let me ask the opposite. Who here, or the compliment, who here has worked with Jupyter Notebooks before? Let me just, uh, by show of hands on the particip participant window. I see two hands, four hands, five, six, seven, Okay, okay. I'm going to take it that we do have some newbies. I hope that's a fair assumption to make right now. What I'll just say, if you haven't used Jupyter Notebook before, it's really cool because you can you can blocks of documentation. They call it Markdown. It's a watered down version of LaTeX. So you can put the equations and so forth. If I double click there, I hope you can see that I've actually used Markdown to make equations, to make all the list and numeration and itemization and so forth. I run it and then it makes a nice compiled uh, documentation with all the links and everything. Then you can mix into Jupyter Notebook. You can prototype real nicely. You can put blocks of code, more documentation, block of code. You can have outputs as you go. So you can really prototype well. I hope that was helpful. What we're going to do is we're going to import our packages. Now, in order to get the job done, we're always going to use NumPy for working with gridded data, Pandas for working with data frames, Matplotlib to plot. We're doing it all the time. We're also going to use a variety of other packages because we need to do MCMC, Markov chains, Monte Carlo, sampling of the posture. We're going to use the PYMC3. Now, it's a great package for being able to do Mont MCMC, and the RViz is there to be able to visualize the result. Okay, so we go ahead and we import those packages. We have the packages. We'll go ahead and load a data set. Now, when we load a data set, we can load it up into a pandas data frame. We'll do a little preview of it, and you can immediately see from the first five samples, it's grain size versus porosity. Now let's go ahead and visualize the data. It is a simple 2D data set, one predictor feature, one response feature. This is it right here. It's a simple data set. It's a toy problem. It has um, some noise in it, but would you all agree it looks pretty linear? Looks like something you could fit a linear model to. It's not too bad. So let's go ahead and run that code to fit a linear regression model. This is the frequentist approach. We're not doing any type of an updating. We're just being totally data driven. And we're going to use ordinarily squares or we'll minimize the L2 norm. And we could talk more about norms. We do that and we get the slope term 0.16. We get the intercept term and we can go ahead and plot that model. Look at the model right there. No surprises. We're doing great. It looks fine. Now, I did tell you, and I think this is important to show, we can do confidence intervals. Here's the frequentest confidence intervals based on the student T distribution for the sampling distribution, an alpha level of 0 0.05. I should have put that as a significance level of 0.95 there. You can see that's giving us the, from the, as far as at a level, of the alpha equals 5%, we would be able to say that, oh, we reject the null hypothesis that the slope is equal to zero. We would say that it's meaningful. So we first of all say that it's a significant model parameter. It's significantly different from zero. And then we can calculate the confidence intervals using those same sampling distributions. And we get the slope was 0.16, but it's anything from 0.12 to 0.19. So in other words, plus, plus or minus about 0 0.03 on the slope. Okay, so this was the overall frequentist approach. I hope you can see it was very straightforward. We're one line of code to build our machine. Um, we have examples where we show building many machines with scikit-learn, and often it's just two lines of code, three lines of code to do a little bit of checking on the model. It's not complicated to do. Let's go ahead and look at Bayesian linear regression. How do we do it? When we work with the PYMC3 package, which we loaded up and declared as PM, you can see we have to do a little bit of custom coding to explain, first of all, these are the prior distributions. How do you know you're doing Bayesian machine learning? Because look at this. We have a prior distribution for the intercept, the slope, and the sigma, that homoscedastic variance or uncertainty in the model. Isn't that cool? So we get to set that. Now, let me challenge you with a question. I said that the intercept has a prior 
of a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 10. Now I'm going to tell you right now that this problem, the response porosity has maybe a standard deviation of like two or one point something. That's a very, very big standard deviation relative to the scale of the distributions. What do you think? What kind of prior is this if my standard deviation is very large? It's a Gaussian distribution with a big standard deviation. What do you all think? Does that sound like a very ah, uninformative, Amir? What do you guys think? Uninformative? Yeah, Chile, you're right there. Hey, howdy, Chile. Nice to see you. Yeah, you guys are, it's clueless about reality. <laughs> Lori, awesome. I love that. You know what? That's, if you put that on my midterm, you get 100% for that. I'd give you full marks for that. And I'd even put like a smiley face because I like the way you put it. That, that's exactly it. I don't know. That's a naive prior. And isn't this cool? By yes, Joshua, we're capturing uncertainty. Isn't that great? We're saying maximal amount of uncertainty. Now we'll run this again and we could try that and you could go on the LMS and try running your own, but you just, you see what you do is you specify the priors, you specify the linear regression model. There it is right there. Right. And then what you do is you just go ahead and you solve for, you solve for the very best values for the parameters given the prior. Now this requires a sampling. It's a Markov chain Monte Carlo. I did not go into the details. We use the nuts approach and what it does, no U-term sampler, it imposes constraints kind of almost like momentum to ensure that you don't have oscillations, instability, that you actually sample the space well. Now I won't run that right now because that does take about 30 seconds to run. But what's really cool is once it's done, we can go ahead and look at the summary statistics. Now, let me just show you this. This is fascinating to me that when you run this approach, you get a lot of diagnostics back. Now you get to get the, you'll get the model parameters, the mean and standard deviation. That's an uncertainty distribution for all your model, model parameters. That's very cool. Now, in addition to that, you're going to get measures like this number of effective now, this is interesting. To sample the problem, you did um, Monte Carlo Markov chain or Markov chain Monte Carlo. Now, what's interesting is your chain can have correlation. So while you may have done a thousand samples, it may be fewer data when you account for the correlation. So that gives you a little warning. It tells us, no, we had some correlation, but we still have a lot of samples. Check that and make sure you have a good sampling. The other thing that's very interesting is that you get what is known as the minimum width Bayesian credibility interval. Okay, so the Bayesian credibility interval is right here. Here's the P25 and the P97.5. That's for an interval of 95%. So we actually get our Bayesian credible credibility interval, which is really, really powerful. Now, the other thing is you get an R hat score. And the R hat score is a very good diagnostic statistic. It actually tells you whether or not you got a good convergence with your sampling of the posture. In other words, did you get to a point where you had stability in the sampling solution? That's really, really cool. And we can see that we're very close to one. We're in good shape. Okay, so we can look at those diagnostic statistics. I want to show you that. Now, if you look at it, you actually get all of the samples along for the intercept, the slope, and the sigma, the homoscedastic uncertainty, you get that from your MCMC approach. And we use four individual chains. You can actually look at the chains and make sure that they were stable, that they had a nice, what they call equilibrium chain, that there's nice stability, there's not non-stationarity. So we've done a good job sampling this problem. Now you take those posture distributions that you sampled, you work hard to make those, and we can go ahead and look at those credibility intervals, the 95% shown right here. And we have them for each one of the model parameters. That's exciting. The other thing we can do, and I think this is super cool, is of course, if you have the uncertainty in the intercept and the slope, you can now calculate the uncertainty in the model. So you see that you have the data, you have the most likely model right here. And if you look really carefully, if you looked at the results, you'll notice they were the same as our frequencies approach because our, wait, why do you think our Bayesian linear regression, its expected value, why do you think it was exactly like the frequentist approach? 
Anybody? What made them the same? Let me, I'm going to let that sit there in the air for a second. I'll just talk about this right here. We can look at all of the models. Ah, Lori, Lori, I'm telling you, that is, uh, that is the perfect way to say it. You started out clueless. You used a naive prior. So now when you went ahead and updated, it's driven just by the data, just like the frequentist approach. The one advantage though, is you, this model does account for the uncertainty distributions in all of the parameters directly, gives you credibility intervals. And if you look in the details, you'll find out credibility intervals are actually more intuitive than confidence intervals. Many people who work in Bayesian approaches, they're driven by that. I hear them make comments about that. They're, uh, look it up, a confidence interval is not what you think it is. Okay, so the other thing we get is we can do posture prediction. And so here we go, we take a given a grain size, given the uncertainty in the model, given the uncertainty around the individual models, we can calculate this. So the most likely prediction right here, which is the same as the frequentist prediction because the fact that we didn't, we had a naive prior is right here, the red dotted line. The model uncertainty, this uncertainty right here is the blue line, the blue PDF, and the prediction interval right here from Bayesian approaches is the black line. In other words, it accounts for uncertainty in the model as we saw with the equations we looked at before, plus the uncertainty given the model. Isn't that cool? So it accounts for all of it and you get a really great um, prediction interval right here driven by Bayesian concepts. Okay, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go ahead and try to rerun that. It is on the learning management system. I invite people to try it out. This is the full workflow of all of the steps, well-documented, simple example, a good introduction to Bayesian approaches. Okay, let me ask a couple of questions so I can be comfortable about our discussion today. Can somebody by chat window tell me what the prior is? Anyone? The prior, what you think you already know before you collect the data. Lori nailed it. Belief, yes. The Bayesian con context actually allows, the Bayesian approach allows you to use belief. There's so many things you can do. Did you know that you can actually take a prior, collect data, get a posture? What happens if you get more data? What should you do? Anybody have any ideas? You did it, you collected data, you updated, you got a posture, and now you collect more data. What's the next step? Anybody? I'm curious because we got a great group here. I'm really interested to see if people grab this. Update, exactly. You know, Chili, you're exactly right. What's very interesting, yes, Joshua nailed it. The posture becomes the prior for the next round. That nailed it. Actually, I gotta tell you, you guys made my day. Just the fact that people got that, that was amazing. You can chain it up. As long as you don't cheat, it works. As long as there's no peaking, it's going to work. You take a prior, you get new data, you get a posture, you get more data, you're not cheating. And then you go ahead and use that as a new likelihood and you make the previous posture of the prior and you keep going. You can sequentially update. This was a wonderful discussion today, guys. I do appreciate it. Um, 